Welcome to class 20 on topics in power electronics and distributed generation. In the last class, we were discussing uh, example problems on fault protection with circuit breakers and fuse. And we looked at a distribution system with uh, three components, circuit breakers, a recloser with an embedded circuit breaker and a fuse. And we plotted the uh, trip time versus uh, current characteristics of uh, such a device. We had the nominal fault current ranges, the lo load current ranges. So, we looked at the properties of the individual uh, devices. And then we looked at the uh, time over current coordination between uh, upstream device and the downstream device. We also checked whether we have backup protection in case one protective device fails. Uh, we also looked at the time margins in the uh, settings of the protection, uh, whether there is uh, adequate margins uh, available in the settings. So, today we will specifically look at, uh, so we looked at plotted the curves, uh, the trip time versus the current curves. Today we will specifically look at the coordination of the circuit breaker with the recloser and the recloser with the fuse. So, the first thing we are looking at what are the objectives of coordination of the circuit breaker uh, with a downstream recloser. Okay. So, the objectives of uh, the coordination of, uh, of a upstream bre circuit breaker and a downstream recloser is uh, we will call zone 1 to be the zone of protection for the circuit breaker and zone 2 for uh, corresponding to the recloser. So, if you have a fault in zone 1, it is a circuit breaker that has to protect. If you have a zone in uh, fault in zone 2, the recloser with its underlying circuit breaker characteristics should provide the protection. Uh, if you are having temporary faults in zone 2, then the recloser attempts should uh, clear temporary faults. If there is a permanent fault in zone 2, then one has to ensure that the recloser locks out before your circuit break upstream breaker trips. So, that is the overall uh, objective you would have for uh, th this particular coordination problem. So, we are looking at uh, then based on the time current curves for your circuit breaker of under underlying circuit breaker of the recloser and for the upstream breaker find out the timings required for the recloser. And again when we look at timings what we are uh, looking at is uh, essentially uh, if you have Uh, the recloser carrying some nominal current and at some point of time a fault occurs and the current goes up and what is plotted is your IRMS versus time. And you have some duration uh, we call called it as T0 and for which the high current would flow, then you have the first uh, open duration T of 1 that is what we have called in this problem. Then we have a duration T re where the recloser uh, recloses which is T C 1 and then you have a duration where it opens again T of 2 and then it recloses does a recloser attempt for a second time. T C 2 and if the fault is still persisting then it locks open. Okay. And this occurs when the current level is, is higher than some i threshold and it is provided to you that uh, the duration of T 0 is about 100 milliseconds 0 0.1 seconds, T of 1 is 6 seconds and uh, T of 2 is 6 seconds and you are required to uh, find out what uh, settings you could use for T C 1 and T C 2. 
So, for T C 1 and T C 2 we have uh, we are asked to find what is T C 1 max. So, we have T 0 is 0 0.1 and if you look at it as a percentage of time required for your upstream breaker. So, 0 0.89 if you was uh, the trip time of C B at a fault current level. maximum fault current level which was uh, I is equal to 3.5 kilo amps for a fault in zone 2. Okay. So, this is essentially this uh, the 1.89 and T 0 is uh, corresponds to 0 0.01. So, if you are looking at essentially as a percentage this is uh, this corresponds to uh, 5.3 percent of the tripping of the circuit breaker. CB's uh, tripping and if you look at uh, the this duration how much it would correspond for the tripping of CBR. So, this would be 0 0.1 divided by 0 0.58 and if you remember uh, the 0 0.58 uh, in the last class discussion was the time of CBR at I is equal to 3.5 kilo amps and so this corresponds to about 17.2 percent of the way into tripping. Okay. If you look at uh, T of 1 duration that corresponds to uh, 6 seconds and we know the reset times for breaker uh, CB and CBR is 20 seconds. So, it would reset by 30 percent in the 6 second duration. So, if you look at both C B and C B R it is fully reset by the end of uh, your uh, off duration. So, if you look at then the next duration available uh, T C 1 max if you allow for another uh, duration of 0 0.58 uh, duration then the C B R itself would actually trip. So, there is no point uh, ex, uh, pushing uh, your uh, reclosed duration to be larger than 0 0.58 seconds. So, or C B R So, you need something less than this add something less than this for margin. Okay. If you take something longer it will uh, the underlying CBR characteristics would uh, cause the device to trip. So, you need it to be something that is smaller than 0.58. So, the next problem is uh, is to look at the uh, objectives of coordination of the operation of the recloser and the fuse. So, if you look at the objectives of uh, coordination between the recloser and the and a downstream fuse. So, if you have a fault in zone 2 then that has to be cleared by the recloser or its underlying circuit breaker. 
if you have a fault in zone 3, if it is a permanent fault in zone 3 that has to be cleared by the fuse. Whereas, if you have a temporary fault in zone 3, then the recloser attempts to clear the temporary faults, but before the recloser locks up or open or locks out essentially the fuse has to blow. So, this is this would be the requirement for coordination between the recloser and the downstream fuse. So, if you look at then what the duration of uh, uh, TC uh, the TC durations are for this particular condition. So, if you make the, the, the time duration to be too small, then there is a chance that the fuse will not blow and the recloser would lock open. So, you want the durations to be larger in this particular case, so as to ensure that the fuse blows for a permanent fault before the recl recloser locks out. So, you look at the case for a couple of uh, uh, conditions. So, so you are looking at what should be the settings for TC2 for fault in zone 3 and you need to select TC2 only after or the melting of the fuse to be earlier so that the lockout does not happen. Okay. So, if you look at this particular condition you need to look at uh, you also know that your fuses have a tolerance of plus or minus 20 percent. So, you consider say the larger uh, plus 20 percent because you are looking at the worst case duration. So, you, you can look at the situation at the maximum current and the minimum current for the fault in the zone. Your T 0 would correspond to 0 0.1 divided by 0 0.65 is uh, this would be 15 correspond to 15 percent where 0 0.65 is the T melt the seconds is the T melt for fuse at current I is equal to 2.1 kilo amps which is the maximum current level for fault in zone 3 and for the fuse with a plus 20 percent I square T. Okay. Then if you look at T of 1 that corresponds to 6 by 90. So, this is 6.7 percent. So, at the end of T of 1 fuse is So, we could consider to be uh, the fuse to be 8 percent melted and then we have uh, your T C 1 that corresponds to 0.58 which we determined from the previous problem. And if you then look at 0.58 as a percentage of the fuse blowing time this would be 90 percent.
So, at the end of T C 1 Now, if you look at uh, what what would be the situation here, we have considered a fuse with I square T of uh, plus 20 uh, percent above the nominal. If you took the fuse which was plus minus 20 percent below the nominal I square T, so if you look at a fuse which was 80 percent of the I square T rating. would already be melted. So, uh, so uh, if you look at uh, uh, a desirable setting of that 0.58, it might be desirable to actually reduce it uh, to actually uh, prevent uh, the melting of the fuse in the first recloser cycle itself uh, because of the settings of the recloser. Okay. But we will uh, continue with this particular problem if you look at T of uh, at this particular maximum current of zone 3, if you look at T of 2 which is 6 seconds and 90 seconds is the, uh, uh, the cool down time of the fuse. So, that corresponds to 6.7 percent. So, at the end of T of 2, fuse is about 92 percent melted. So, if you look at the remaining uh, 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 7 to 8 percent uh, melting, uh, you need a T C uh, 2 which is greater than 0 0.05 seconds. At I max, I f max of zone 2. Okay. Now, we will look at what happens at the I f min current level of zone 3 so you have now t0 corresponding to 0.1 by 1.33 so 1.33 is the melt time corresponding to the fuse uh, with uh, plus 20 percent uh, i square t so, that would now correspond to 7.51 percent T of 1 corresponds to 6 by 90, this is 6.7 percent. So, fuse is 0.84 percent melted. So, then you could calculate T C 2 if it is 0 0.58 and 1.33 is the melt time at this particular 1.4 kilo amps current level that would be 43.7 percent and T of 2 is 
So, if you look at the time that is required to melt it for the remaining uh, uh, the uh, 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 remaining percentage uh, for this number to reach 100. So, you can calculate what your T C 2 has to be, it has to be larger than that. So, so what you would say is T C 2 has to be larger than 0.83 seconds uh, with some margin. So, that uh, the fault current in zone 3 does not uh, uh, cause the fuse to still conduct when a permanent fault is still in that particular zone. So, we saw in the previous case that at uh, uh, the point, uh, 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 the the point uh, 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 five eight second settings. This particular fuse is already melted, so we will, can also look at the situation where T C one is modified to ensure that uh, uh, the fuse, even at the lower end of the to tolerance range, does not melt uh, by reducing the T C one duration. Okay. So, you could calculate what could be a, a, a T C 1 duration. So, if you look at uh, the fuse uh, with uh, the point 8 level uh, and zone 3 fault uh, with I f max equal to 2.1 kilo amp, you have T 0 corresponding to 0.1 by 0.46 that corresponds to 21.56 percent. Uh, T of 1 corresponding to 6 out of the 90 seconds of the fuse cool down time that is 6.7 percent. So, fuse is so if you look at uh, 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 so, if T C 1 is 0.58 seconds, this would correspond to 0.58 divided by 0.46 or this is 125 percent. It means that fuse is already melted, it will not see a secondary close cycle. So, if T C 1 is reduced to a smaller value, say we will take it as 0 0.38 seconds, then so at the end of uh, 
the TC1 it is 82.4 percent melt, melted which means it is uh, not uh, the fuse is not at damaged at that particular point. Uh, so, So, the fuse will see a second reclose cycle. And, uh, and then we will have to then recalculate what T C 2 has to be for this new setting of T C 1. Okay. So, One point two times the nominal value, which is two into ten to the power of six ampere square second. So you can calculate TC two. So you can calculate T zero, which would correspond to seven point five percent. T of one would correspond to six point seven percent. TC one which is 0.38 now divided by 1.33 this corresponds to 28.7 percent so you can say fuse So, for the remaining 77.1 percent melting one point zero three seconds duration. So, the new value of uh, your T C 2 should be greater than 1.03 seconds with a margin. So, you can see that uh, if you uh, want to make sure that you do not you prevent uh, uh, fuse blowing by trying to make the maximum use of the recloser, you will have to uh, 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 make sure that uh, you are doing the operation so that you do not have unnecessary wastage of fuses and you do these calculations to ensure that you save the fuse as far as possible. So, the next problem is <coughs> is uh, from the value of the T C 1 and T C 2 that has been calculated, uh, what should be the uh, current threshold level for operation of the recloser to prevent uh, nu nuisance lockout of the recloser before melting of the fuse. And we saw in this problem the as the current level reduces, you need more time for the fuse to melt. So, if you uh, allow the threshold level to be too low, then the amount of duration you need for the recloser to op, uh, 
uh, for TC2 becomes longer and longer so as to ensure that the fuse melts first before the recloser locks out so as to attain the objectives of the coordination that you had where a permanent fault over here causes this to fail before the upstream device locks out. So, uh, suitable, uh, 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 suitable uh, uh, threshold level can be uh, corresponding to the time that you have used for the IF min calculation and the IF min calculation that we had uh, in um, the example that we looked at was uh, IF min for zone 3 was 1.4 kilo amps. We could use that as a threshold. So, that uh, as uh, for current levels below that you do not have nuisance lock out of a upstream device for a fault in the down, downstream zone. Okay. So, then you uh, are uh, given uh, the next uh, problem where you have uh, a DG that is connected and because of the connection of the DG. So, we are looking at a case where the DG is connected uh, close to the uh, substation itself at the very upstream which causes the fault current levels uh, across the feeder to actually go up uh, with the fault. Uh, this is a simpler possible configuration where you could have DG is connected anywhere along the feeder. So, because the fault current levels have gone up you are asked to actually recalculate your TC1, TC2 settings etcetera for achieving coordination. So, we will look specifically at what the concerns are rather than redoing all the calculations. So, if you look at this particular situation. with the DG unit in zone 2 4.2 kilo amps. So, the CBR tripping is 0 0.42 seconds and not the 0.58 seconds that we had as calculated previously. So, if you had set uh, the, the CBR settings, uh, so there is a possibility that now, because of your CBR setting, uh, because your CBR trips earlier, you can have uh, the CBR trip earlier uh, in uh, for a fault in zone 2 rather than uh, allowing a recluse action which will uh, do multiple attempts to clear a fault okay, for a fault in zone 2. So, essentially if you look at the situation over here, if you are having a fault over here, now because of the reduction in uh, the circuit breaker timings because of the higher fault current, you will now have the possibility that the underlying breaker would cause it to lock out before the recluse attempts complete. Okay. So, there is a possibility that a temporary fault would see an outage of the downstream zone rather than a recluse attempt. So, another concern is uh, if you look at uh, at uh, IF min of zone 3 is now 1.7 kilo amps. So, so one could be the uh, possibility that now an overcurrent from zone 4 can actually actuate uh, the recloser because uh, your uh, uh, current levels you expect the recloser to protect uh, temporary falls in uh, zone 2 and zone 3. Now, even zone 4 uh, can uh, have falls which might uh, trigger the recloser 
also if you look at the situation at uh, of uh, i f max Uh, this may not be too bad a thing because he, if it is a temporary fault in zone 4, the recloser is helping out. But if you have a large load that is starting in zone 4 like a, a large induction machine, a recloser attempt will cause the delay in startup of the machine which can potentially cause overheating etcetera. Okay. If you look at uh, I f max. of zone 3, and look at the T 0 1 duration corresponding to 0 0.1 by now 0 0.42. So, that is 23.8 percent and T of 1 which is 6.7 percent corresponding to 6.7 percent. So, the fuse is about 17 percent melted at T of, at the end of T of 1. Then if you look at T C 1, So, the fuse has already melted at the end of the first reclose cycle. So, you can see that the, uh, the previous uh, setting of 0 0.381, 0 0.38 seconds for T C 1 uh, with the addition of the D G is now uh, uh, al uh, already causing the fuse to melt. So, your fuse saving strategy is not working. So, you need to further adjust T C 1. can be further adjusted say to uh, 0 0.28 seconds further reducing T C 1 uh, for uh, ensuring reclose uh, atoms. So, you can see that uh, uh, what you would have originally considered as uh, the settings uh, might have to change once you add the D G into the particular system, which is one, uh, one of the concerns where because the D G might be added by one party whereas, the recloser etcetera might be set by some design engineer at the commissioning of that particular feeder. So, it, that person may not be available at the point when the D G is being added. So, there is a complexity of who will do the calculation, what should be the new settings. So, th there are concerns of protection coordination when you add a DG to the existing system. So, uh, we'll, uh, so we have seen that uh, 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 there are concerns, we were discussing about uh, the also the voltage profile on the feeder when uh, you have the DG uh, and when you have the normal operation of the uh, feeder. So, we will today look at uh, 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 other possible configurations of, uh, of a feeder. You could have uh, the majority of the feeders are radial distribution systems which uh, we have been discussing so far in the class. And uh, if you look at the radial uh, distribution systems, uh, they have say 2 nines of availability or 0.99 percent availability. So, if you look at what is uh, 
0.99 percent availability of the year it means that out of 365 days you might have 2.6 days of outage uh, the remaining time you your system could work nominally assuming you have the power available uh, to actually provide the load uh, you, uh, you could expect about uh, uh, 3 to 4 days of outage per year on a radial distribution system and people look at uh, more complex distribution systems. So, the next com more uh, complex uh, network compared to just a radial uh, structure might be a ring structure where you can actually go around in a loop or in a ring. And if you look at uh, the, the reliability here you might have 4 nines 0.99 uh, nine per, uh, availability which means which should correspond to about 1 hour of outage per year. Okay. So, this is a more complex network, but your uh, reliability is improving. So, if you say what is the next in terms of improvement of uh, reliability instead of just having a ring you can have a more complex uh, meshed structure where your reliability can go to 6 nines. Uh, so, 6 nines of uh, reliability would mean that your outage per year would reduce to less than a minute. And uh, if you have a high end UPS de de dedicated to specific loads, the reliability of such an UPS can be even uh, of the order of uh, it, can, it can actually provide backup power with nine nines of reliability. So, if you have large uh, uh, computer uh, systems, uh, you can have the possibility of uh, outage of less than a second per year with uh, uh, high quality uh, UPS backup systems. Okay. So, if you look at uh, a structure of such a, uh, a, a system, you can see that uh, as you want better power quality, uh, you are going in a direction such as this and this is actually going in the direction where it is more expensive. Uh, uh, where you are willing to pay that higher cost for uh, uh, lesser outage. Or higher power quality uh, you are going in uh, paying off paying more for getting better power quality. Okay. And if you look at uh, 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 these uh, the radial the ring or a network type of distribution all the loads connected to the ring or the all the loads connected to that particular radial feeder or in a network type of distribution system will see the same level of uh, power quality. So, irrespective of whether uh, the loads require such a complex network or not you provide that given level of power uh, quality depending on the complexity of the network whereas, something like an UPS can be for dedicated loads. Okay. So, depending on which particular load needs the backup, maybe a, a computer system needs a very high power quality, whereas a, a building thermal system might it might be okay to actually have a, a slightly longer duration of outage. You won't know if the uh, heaters or air conditioners are switched off for maybe a minute or so. Uh, in terms of lights you might be willing to tolerate a few seconds of outages in the lights, but uh, so depending on what load is being connected you might have dif different levels of requirements and uh, ideally it should be possible to tune your, your particular requirement to the level of power quality and the cost you are willing to pay for it. So, we will first uh, start with uh, a, a net uh, ring or a 
or a loop distribution system and see uh, what would uh, we will look at it with an example uh, where you have a loop. Uh, so, what is shown over here is uh, instead of just a radial structure, now you have a feeder which is in the form of a loop and it is being uh, divided in this particular example into 4 zones. Uh, say you have this being fed from uh, a substation where you have 2 transformers with uh, a level of redundancy. So, even if one is out, you could provide power using the other transformer. Uh, and in the radial system, if any point on the feeder has a problem, then the whole feeder is down. So, in this particular example, you could have a, a possibility because there is a possibility of getting power from both uh, from 2 directions, you have the possibility of uh, localizing the fault into smaller sections and ensuring that the entire feeder does not see the outage, uh, smaller sections might see an outage and uh, you have uh, overall higher power quality to the average user across the network. So, we will look at a couple of uh, cases how you would operate such a system. Uh, say under normal conditions you might operate it almost like the traditional uh, 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 radial distribution system your uh, breakers 1, A, B, C, 2, 3, 6 and 5 might be closed. So, what is shown in green uh, indicates a closed circuit breaker, uh, 4 might be open. So, essentially you have feeder A and feeder B and in this uh, particular example you have uh, this potentially the, uh, the ring or the loop can be covering a longer distance. So, you might have uh, voltage regulators that are on the ring. So, you have now, at the position of the ring, you have a voltage boost being provided as say if one is going from let us call this the primary side and the secondary side. So, as you are going from the primary to secondary, you are providing a boost on the uh, uh, voltage regulator on the feeder. So, you can have 2, uh, two SVRs, you could have 1 SVR, dip, uh, could be a, a po range of configurations uh, depending on different types of uh, systems. So, overall you, under normal conditions you have a feeder where your voltage is regulated uh, based on what your nominal value is and it is the system is trying to regulate the voltage to the nominal value. So, you could think about a uh, couple of situations say if you have a fault in uh, zone 1 A then essentially uh, breaker 2 and breaker 3 would open and then uh, under normal if it was just a radial system then even zone 2A would see the outage. But now because you can close uh, breaker 4, uh, breaker 4 closes and essentially the four fault is localized to Z1A and uh, the power now flows uh, to Z2A to uh, and, uh, 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 and provides power to 3 sections even when you have a fault in one particular zone. So, you have power up to this point and essentially 2 and 3 isolates the fault. You could also have maybe a, a, a fault in say transformer A or you might be servicing transformer A in which case you might say open 1 A, 1 C and 2 and in which case uh, the power is now flowing uh, through all the way to all the 4 zones and uh, ensuring that uh, servicing can be done at the substation with without uh, de-energizing de your uh, uh, cus customers or who are the loads on the feeder. Uh, you can immediately see that the feeder has to be rated each each part of the feeder has to cater to the entire load on the feeder. So, the cost of the system can be higher than the traditional feeder, but then you have the advantage that you do not have outages under a variety of conditions. So, if you then look at this particular scenario where you uh, you have the, the series voltage regulator. So, if you look at the voltage profile in this particular configuration. So, here you have as you go from your left to the right of your uh, 
uh, of your uh, regulator you get a voltage boost. Here in this particular configuration where you go from the right to left you have the voltage boost. If you compare that particular situation to what was the nominal configuration of uh, under normal conditions when uh, everything was under nominal conditions, when you went from the left to right the boost was being provided. Here if you look at the different zones, as you uh, go through this particular uh, 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 if you as you go through this particular uh, 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 across the series voltage regulator uh, on the series vo voltage regulator as you are going from left to right you are actually getting the boost as would be the nominal con configuration but because now your loop is providing power in the other way as you are going over here from the close breaker 4 towards close breaker 3 it is actually going from right to left and you still need a boost which means that it is the opposite of the voltage what would be applied at the SVR compared to the nominal configuration where you had a boost going from left to right here you are having a boost going from right to left. So, if you see how this is being accomplished it means that essentially uh, if the power flow is in this particular direction you get a boost from left to right, but if the power flow in the previous example is in the opposite direction you need to actually uh, change the polarity of the boost uh, to ensure that uh, your overall feeder voltage profile is appropriate. If you went the other way your voltage would further sag below and that would not be acceptable. Okay. So, you cannot just have uh, because these series voltage regulators do not know what the status of these breakers are it has to make its decision on whether to provide the boost or a buck. Uh, it does not have cables or signaling from status signals from the other breakers it is making its decision based on its local measurement and the local measurement that it can make is which direction is the power flow. So, you could then think about a situation where you might have a DG and say if you have a DG downstream of a, a series re, a voltage regulator and you are operating under normal condition of this ring and if the DG power is sufficient to send power the other way along the feeder. So, instead of providing the boost what would be the normal condition it would assume that now you have a configuration where uh, the switch over has occurred and the power flow is going in the opposite direction which means that instead of providing a boost you could now have the voltage profile flipping over and now uh, this whole section of the feeder will now uh, potentially see a conflict in the voltage the the SVR would try to apply try to apply an, a voltage of the op opposite polarity. So, which could uh, cause uh, increasing circulating currents within the loop etcetera which can potentially damage the system. So, you can see that uh, uh, the issue of uh, introducing the DG can actually cause uh, potential problems in uh, network uh, more complex networks such as uh, radial uh, distribution systems. Also if you look at uh, a, a network distribution, uh, distribution type of system, uh, uh, if you look at the traditional network distribution system the, the network is not at the regular distribution system it is actually on the secondary distribution system is what is being networked. So, if you have uh, transmission system coming to a substation plus feeders this the feeders would be at the uh, the medium voltage 11 kV etcetera. Uh, the network is actually at the low voltage which might be at uh, 415 volts or whatever is the consumption voltage of the network. So, here what we have shown is an example of a network you might have loads on the network connected to different points.
And uh, essentially if you have a network such as this, uh, uh, you are essentially having redundancy in the power flow into that particular network. So, if you have a fault on the network essentially the, the network protectors on such a distribution system what is shown over here are network protectors N p 1 through N p 4 would act to actually clear a fault within the network system itself. Uh, one functionality of a network protector is that it will allow power flow only from your uh, feeder into your network system. So, it will if it detects that the power flow is happening in the opposite direction the network pr protector will open on an instantaneous basis. So, within a cycle it would try to open in case it detects a power flow in the opposite direction. So, if you have a fault on say feeder A because of the fault there is a uh, the, the flow of power will be towards the fault and detecting the flow of power in, in, into the fault essentially the network protectors 1 and 2 would open and essentially the spot network would get immediately isolated from the fault. So, for any anything that happens on this particular feeder essentially it can be de-energized for servicing repair etcetera your network protectors would ensure that the power flow it does not go out of the network and uh, the availability on the spot network would stay high. Okay. Uh, if you now think about a situation where now you have a DG connected to such a network system, you have the possibility that the DG might try to send power back out into the into your feeder and your network protector might cycle open in response to seeing the power flow from the DG and you would you might still think that okay, even if there is a one network protector that cycles, uh, cycling of the network protector is not desirable, but even if uh, you have a network protector that is cycling and say you have a fault now on feeder uh, uh, B, then essentially your system would try, try to send out power and uh, open up these two protectors and you might end up overloading the only network protector that is available you might have redundancy that if uh, one set of protectors go away you might have redundancy, but you might not have redundancy even when a reduced set uh, is not non-functional. So, you might be uh, seeing that the loads in this overall uh, secondary network might see a shutdown in case you have uh, DGs that are now connected to uh, uh, a network distribution system, a networked secondary distribution system. So, the potential for problems uh, increase once you have uh, more complicated uh, uh, configurations of distribution systems. So, so with this we can actually look at the concerns of DGs in distribution systems and uh, we will look at the concerns and the methods to answer. Uh, address some of the concerns are primarily related to uh, how quickly we can uh, uh, disconnect the DG, how quickly we can control the power flow through the DG etcetera and uh, how many times how rapidly you can disconnect. So, the trends towards uh, solving some of this are uh, through power electronic means and so we will look at uh, how effective power electronics means can be in addressing these issues and uh, power electronics tend to be more expensive than traditional uh, systems. So, we will have to look at first how cost effective it is which implies that you need to measure costs and see whether your engineering is cost effective to actually figure out whether you are moving in the right direction to address these problems. Thank you. Thank you.